Paul. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think that we uh, might have a quorum. So, and it is five fifteen now. Uh, so, um, as the new chair of the San Mateo County Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission, I would like to call our meeting to order. Uh, hey, everybody, do you want me to do roll call? Um, uh, let me just uh, give a little preview. Um, in the meetings uh, last year, we, um, well, we're gonna start off a little bit differently than we have in, uh, in past meetings. Instead of kind of everyone going around and, and doing introductions, what I'd like to do is, uh, in the interest of speeding it up a little, is, uh, is have our Vice Chair of Administration, uh, Commissioner Huber Levy, call roll call for commissioners. Uh, that way commissioners will um, say that they're here. And, um, and then anyone else that's speaking during the meeting, um, when we get to partner updates, for example, you can introduce yourself uh, at that time. And then if there's anyone else uh, who would like to introduce themselves, um, please do that in the chat after we, um, after we do roll call. Okay, so let's get started. Um, go ahead, uh, our Vice Chair of Administration. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I'm joining the... What was that? Go ahead, Karen. Okay, so Commissioner Labuise. Present, here. Commissioner Enriquez. Commissioner Bocanegra. I know oh, I'm here. He's there. I, we just didn't hear him. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Flores. Present. Commissioner Nori. Here. Commissioner Rasmussen. Here. Commissioner Swope. Here. Commissioner Teleria. Here. Commissioner Willis. I think I saw him. We'll see him yet. And Commissioner Wilson. Don't see her yet either. I do see they're, Commissioner Enriquez. They're coming in from another meeting, so they'll be here in just a minute. I was there too. Right. Okay. Commissioner Enriquez, you're there now? Yes, present. Great. Okay, I think we do have a quorum. Uh, uh, yes, we do. Is that right? Yes, we do. Okay, good. Then um, let's carry on. Um, I think that the next item on uh, the agenda was uh, for me to, oh no, the next item on the agenda is for us to uh, adopt the resolution uh, per AB 361 to continue to hold these meetings remotely. I move that we adopt the resolution to hold meetings remotely. Is our second. I second. I second. That. Great. And uh, the text for that is in your agenda packet. Uh, if you'd like, if anyone would like to refer to it, but uh, I think that there is no objection. So we will then. Uh, when you uh, have, a, you need to take a vote if you have a, a motion in a second. Okay. Uh, let's do a verbal vote because I think we aren't going to get any nays. Uh, so, uh, commissioners, if you could come off mute and on a voice vote, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The motion is adopted. Thank you, Susan. Uh, so, we will um carry on and um the first thing that i wanted to do as the new chair uh is just to say uh welcome everybody very happy to see so many people present uh for um juvenile justice and delinquency prevention commission meeting for january and and um it's a real honor for me to take on the role of chair and I look forward to us having a great 2022. I wanted to start by reading something from the San Mateo County Handbook on Commissions, 
which says, quote, the chairperson should take a back seat during discussions. <laughs> uh, it goes on to say, quote, because the chair conducts the meeting, it is common courtesy for the chair to take a less active role than other members of the body in debates and discussions. So I found this interesting because it reminds me of a lesson on leadership that I really admire. And that is that uh, an effective leader should lead with humility and act as a servant to others. Um, I think Tony Barrick really uh, embodied that for us uh, and uh, in the last year. And so I would really like to carry that on. Uh, so I said when I asked you to vote for me for chair that I also wanted the commission to be very action oriented, continue to be action oriented, and I want us to have real vigorous debates. Uh, so I want to continue that, but I, I also believe we're going to get more things done if all of us operate with that sort of humility. Uh, I've been attending some diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings recently, and there's a core concept in DEI called cultural humility, which essentially means we should all keep in mind what we don't know and try very hard to walk in each other's shoes. So if this year all of us really listen to each other, we try hard to understand each other, uh, and if we do that, we can have vigorous debates, we can have disagreements, but we can still walk away resolved to serve the youth of the county, which is why we're all here. Uh, and I'm gonna do my best to guide our meetings and discussions in an orderly way so we can do just that. So welcome everyone and um, looking forward to having a great year. Uh, let's get on with the business of the meeting. Um, the first thing that we need to do is, uh, the first thing that's on the agenda is for us to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Um, before we do that, uh, I'll just say that we did receive a number of comments uh, and corrections and typos uh, uh, from some of the commissioners, mostly typos and that sort of thing. And so uh, there were enough that I think it's a good idea that um, we maybe recirculate a, uh, a version of the minutes and, um, and we push this item to, the, to February. Uh, so it, it just, in the interest of time, I wanna make sure we have enough time to get to the agenda items at the end where especially talking about our, our plans for the year. Uh, and so I'm going to suggest we take this one off the table for now, and uh, we will push this to February and we'll recirculate. We, would I, yeah. I, do I need to make a motion to, to delay the approval of the November minutes until our February meeting to allow for corrections? We can, we can do it by unanimous consent. Perfect. Yeah, I think okay, if there, if no, there is if, no objection. If there, I'll take that, Susan. Yeah, if there are no objections to doing that and hearing none, then we'll, we'll move that to February. Great. Uh, all right, so then uh, the next thing we need to do is to review our current agenda for this meeting and approve that. Uh, so do we have a uh, motion to approve the, today's agenda? You can also say if there are no objections. Sure, yeah. Yes. Uh, is there, are, are there any objections to, uh, to approving today's agenda? Um, I would like to add just two things to the number seven, which we may not get to, which would be uh, diversion project and increasing school attendance project. Right, updates on that. That's uh, the last agenda item, Susan. Yeah. yeah. Okay, anything else from anyone? Okay, so with those two small additions, then, um, and hearing no objections, then uh, uh, let's adopt the current agenda. Great. So moving on to the, uh, the next agenda item, um, uh, an administrative item, I want to call on Commissioner Flores to give us just a, a quick update on 2021 inspections since our November meeting, um, we did complete those. So uh, Commissioner Flores, please go ahead. Uh, yes, all inspections were complete um, and also all of the um, reports and letters to the um, appropriate um, 
parties were sent out. They were mailed and sent out. Um, so I just want to thank you, thank everybody who um, did a great job on the inspections um, and, and on the reports. Um, so those were finalized and sent out. And um, thank, thanks to everybody who participated within that. Great. Uh, are there any questions uh, about the inspection reports or the completing that process? Okay, great. Um, I do have one question, uh, um, Commissioner Flores. Are they posted on the website now? Um, that I am not sure. I could ask Adriana um, and, and get back to you on that. Okay, if they're not, then um, then let's get them posted. And uh, and so anyone in the, uh, any members of the public can see those inspection reports on the, on the uh, commission website. Right. Johanna, I saw your hand go up. Yes, and I have placed them onto the website. They are currently on our website. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Okay, good. All right, then, if there aren't any other questions from commissioners about that, um, thank you, Rebecca, and we'll um, carry on to the next agenda item. Great. So uh, now for some uh, uh, fun part, we've taken care of some administrative business, so let's get to um, swearing in new commissioners, uh, our new commissioners. And we're also going to reappoint and swear in um, Commissioner Flores, whose term has ended. So, uh, so that our new commissioners can participate in the meeting, um, let's get to that. And I am looking for the honorable, there she is. I'm here. This Hello. is Judge Cadet. Sorry the about Judge my- Shanae Cadet, welcome. Sorry about my uh, my tardiness. I had trouble finding the the uh, link, but you know I was welcome. able to locate it. So so happy to be here. Congratulations um, to all three commissioners that will be sworn in and or resworn in um, today. Um, so I will proceed if it's okay via um, via um, alphabetical order. So I'll start with Stephen Duddy, if that's okay. Stephen, are you eight. here? That'd be perfect. Perfect. Okay. All right. So I would like you to repeat after me. I, Stephen Duddy. I, Stephen Duddy. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties that I am about to enter. The duties I'm about to enter. All right, so this is subscribed and sworn to me today. Congratulations. Thank you. It, this is the 25th day of January. And um, the appointment um, says it's already signed by the presiding judge, Leland Davis III. It says that I, Leland Davis III, presiding judge of the Superior Court, County of San Mateo, do hereby appoint Stephen Duddy as a member of the Juvenile Justice Commission in and for the San Mateo County for the term prescribed by law. And I am now signing in concurrence. Thank you. Thank you and welcome and congratulations. Thank congratulations, you. Congratulations, Steve. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm excited. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so the next person in alphabetical order would be Rebecca Flores. Uh, Ms. Flores, are you here? I'm here. Wonderful. All right, please repeat after me. I, Rebecca Flores. I, Rebecca Flores. Do solemnly swear or affirm. To solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. 
that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties I am about to enter. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties I'm about to enter. All right, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So it um, reads, and again, it's signed already by uh, Judge Leland Davis III, the presiding judge of the San Mateo County Superior Court. It states that I, Leland Davis III, presiding judge of the Superior Court, uh, County of San Mateo, do hereby reappoint Rebecca Flores as a member of the Juvenile Justice Commission in and for San Mateo County for the term prescribed by law. And I will sign now with my concurrence. And Welcome. it's dated the 25th day of January, 2022. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank Welcome you back. for your service. Thank you. <laughs> All right, and last but not least, um, I wanna make sure I'm pronouncing this correct. Is it Armand Kahare Aurora? Yeah. Is, is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my first try. Yay. All right. Welcome, Armand. All right. Please repeat after me. I, Armand Kare Aurora. I, Armand Kare Aurora. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties I'm about to enter. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties I'm about to enter. All right, congratulations. Thank you. All right, and so, uh, judge Leland Davis III, the presiding judge of San Mateo County Superior Court, has already signed this. It states that I, Leland Davis III, presiding judge of the Superior Court, County of San Mateo, do hereby appoint Armand Kare Aurora as a member of the Juvenile Justice Commission in and for San Mateo County for the term prescribed by law. And I'm signing now in concurrence. on this 25th day of January in the year 2022. Congratulations. All right, and then um, is Adriana here? Um, the, um, I, I think we've got an administrative person. I just wanted to let her know, either either um, Adriana or Monroe, that um, I'm out this week, but if it's okay with you, I will deliver these on um, the original copies on Monday. Is that okay? Uh, that would be fine. Thank you so much, Judge Cadet. All right, if you need it sooner and if you decide later that you need it sooner, just email me and I'll drive it over in the evening. This week I'm in, I'm in juvenile dependency training um, from 8.30 to 4.30 all day. So it would be better for me if I could bring them on Monday, but if you That's need right. it sooner, I I'll think, bring them. Uh, I think it'll be fun. Adriana is extremely efficient. So even if she gets it in a few days, uh, I have confidence it will get to the right place. Wonderful. And congratulations again to all of the new commissioners and thank you to the new commissioners and all the existing commissioners and community members for everything that you're doing for juvenile justice. Much appreciated. Thank you. And uh, 
thank you and welcome to you uh, in your official duties for, for the first time representing the court here at the, at the commission meeting. So uh, it's good, good to have you. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And it's so fun to just start off with this wonderful, you know, <laughs> definitely, uh, swearing definitely in. a fun way to start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, moving on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, after that, after all that fun, uh, just a little uh, bit of a sad note, um, which some of you, I think many of the commissioners have already heard, uh, but I'm not sure if everyone has heard. Um, but uh, Commissioner Tony Barrick, who was our one of our co-chairs last year, um, decided in December um, that she would be stepping down from the commission. Uh, and so she officially uh, gave us her resignation as of the end of last year. And so as of January the 1st, uh, we have uh, an opening uh, on the on the commission. So. I wanted to just read quickly from uh, an excerpt from her letter. And then I also prepared a, a, uh, a resolution to thank her for her work. So just briefly, she said, with a solid foundation, passionate commissioners, commissioners and an excellent new leadership team starting in 2022, I am confident the commission will continue to make good progress in meeting JJDPC strategic goals and moving San Mateo County closer to the commission's aspirations over the years to come. Uh, so that was a very nice way to put it. And, uh, and, uh, and so, like I said, I did write a resolution expressing gratitude for all of Tony's great work. Uh, and that is in the agenda packet, but I'm just going to read it into the record right now. Um, a resolution expressing gratitude for Tony Barrick. Whereas Antoinette Tony Barrick served as a commissioner on the Cemetery County Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission for many years, and as its co-chair from January 2020 to December 2021. Whereas in the first few months of 2020, Commissioner Barrick as co-chair created and directed a strategic planning committee for the commission, and that committee revised the commission's mission and developed new aspirations and projects as part of its new strategic plan. Whereas Commissioner Barrick had experience in corporate planning before joining the commission, she wrote thorough plans and reports for the commission, as well as engaging and productive agendas for commission meetings, all with her extraordinary attention to detail. Whereas Commissioner Barrick demonstrated exemplary qualities of leadership as co-chair, exhibiting the humility, patience, diplomacy, steadiness, and care of a true servant leader, and was throughout her service to the commission exam an example for other commissioners. Therefore, be it resolved that the San Mateo County Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission wishes to express its heartfelt gratitude and appreciation for Tony's service to the commission and to the youth of San Mateo County. And that, and that this commission wishes her success and happiness in all of her further endeavors. So uh, I would entertain a motion to I adopt the we, resolution. I move we adopt the resolution of gratitude for Tony Barrett. Do you have a second? Second. All right, let's... Uh, Let's have a, um, a voice vote to adopt the resolution. If um, commissioners could come off mute. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you very much. Then the motion to uh, pass a resolution to Thank Tony Barrick is adopted. And uh, I don't know if Tony was able to make it to the meeting or not. Um, I let her know that we would be doing this, but uh, we will get a copy over to her. And, um, and uh, thank you everybody for doing that. I, I think Tony did a great job for us as co-chair along with, along with Deborah, uh, who is still with us and, uh, and uh, really did set a great example for us. So let's carry that on. 
the um, the next item on the agenda is um, public comment. Uh, we reserve item two on the agenda for any public comments uh, from members of the public that are not related to items already on the agenda. Uh, so if you are a member of the public and you have comments on items that are not on the agenda and would like to speak up, then uh, just raise your hand using the reactions um, uh, button down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, there's a way there to actually raise your hand in Zoom. And also, and I guess if you can't figure that out, then you're welcome to just come off mute as well. Any public comment? Okay, um, hearing none, we'll go on to item three on the agenda. And item three, are updates from our uh, from our partners. So uh, prior to the meeting, I uh, I did reach out to uh, our partners who provide these updates uh, and suggested that each month that we might uh, have a common question that everyone tries to answer. Thought that would be an interesting way. Uh, in addition to whatever updates they have to um, to give us as to what's what's happening in their areas, that um, that we might have a common question and and you know I, certainly a question on my mind and I think on all of our minds right now is um, the Omicron surge and how that might be impacting their areas. Uh, so, with that, I would call again on, on Judge Cadet, who's first on the list. Um, Judge Cadet, are you still there? And do you, do you have any updates for us on what's going on uh, in the juvenile court and how you all are handling the Omicron surge? Well, yeah, so we're concerned about the Omicron um, surge. So we do have a preference that um, folks attend court via Zoom. You know, we have Zoom credentials that go out for our morning sessions and our afternoon sessions, the Zoom links, as you know, like change for every session because the juvenile proceedings are uh, confidential. Um, so we don't keep the, um, the uh, same Zoom credentials. Um, but if people do want to attend in person, that's totally fine. So we're, you know, allowing that as well. So um, generally my experience over the past couple of weeks is that most people, including witnesses, um, are on Zoom and nobody's had any objections to that. They're able to confront their witnesses um, via Zoom. And um, some people have decided to come in in person um, if they had particular issues or if they felt like a hearing was really important to them and that's fine with us. Um, you know, everyone is wearing masks and uh, maintaining social distance. And, um, you know, there was a question as to whether we would continue with adoptions and um, Judge Edizadi and I decided we would continue with those. We generally hold those on, on Friday mornings and we decided we would continue with those. So we've been holding those um, in person as well with extended family and friends able to participate uh, via Zoom. So we're trying to um, keep spirits up and, you know, and, and everything notwithstanding the um the surge um and also to be very safe during the surge great thank you um any questions from commissioners okay great thank you judge mm -hmm. cadet thank you uh so our next uh update comes from uh, Ron Reyes from the Private Defender Program. Good evening, everyone. Ron Reyes. I'm the managing attorney with the Private Defender Program Juvenile Office. Uh, just uh, follow up with Judge, what Judge Cadet had indicated that uh, about a couple weeks now, uh, the court had uh, allowed for uh, Zoom hearings for all contested hearings. Most of the attorneys have been uh, following that direct uh, that indication from the court. Uh, and as the judge indicated, there are times when the attorneys make an assessment if, uh, if their presence is uh, needed to be in court, uh, then they make that um, 
you know, they make that appearance in person. And oftentimes for us, if the client had indicated they would like to be in court in person, then the attorney usually accompanies the client to be in person as well. So we'll keep doing that until we hear from the court on, you know, hopefully we'll go back to how we were doing business uh, prior to this latest change. I'm happy to answer any questions. And Ron, if you have any other updates, I didn't intend for the updates just to be about how things are going with Omicron, but if there's anything else that you think is relevant uh, to update us on with what's going on in your area, um, please, please do. Sounds good. I don't have any specific updates for today, but I will definitely keep that in mind for next month. Okay. Any questions from commissioners for, uh, for Ron? Great. All right. Then moving on. Thank you. Our, yeah, thank you. Our, uh, our next update comes from the district attorney's office. Uh, and I think I saw Sh uh, Sharon Cho with us. Hi, everyone. I uh, hope you can all hear me. So I'm Sharon Cho and I supervise the juvenile branch for the district attorney's office. Um, we are all working physically in the office. I know some others have transitioned back to remote. Um, for the juvenile branch of the DA's office, we are still reporting in physically, which is not to say we're immune to Omicron. Uh, we, we have suffered those um, as well, but uh, not it hasn't impacted our workflow or the services that we offer or anything like that. Um, in terms of any specific updates, there isn't really anything uh, new in terms of anything that's happening in our office at the moment. So, any questions from commissioners? I see Commissioner Enriquez, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think that um, it will be very helpful for speakers to kind of elaborate more about youth, what you guys are doing in your agencies, uh, just for the, also for the public. But, you know, I know that um, there's a lot happening right now and I'm glad that you guys are staying safe, but I would like to hear more about um, the youth, what is the district attorney's office doing when it comes to youth, uh, just for the context of, you know, people and are, you know, on the Zoom call. that will be helpful, thanks. So I can speak generally about what the DA's office does, if that's helpful. Um, sure. Broadly speaking, you know, officers go out and they investigate crimes. For juvenile cases, the incidents are all submitted to the juvenile probation department. They use their own screening process um, in determining which cases come forward to the DA's office. But once the case is submitted to the DA's office, our office then reviews the report, uh, determines, th there's a lot of different options, determines if there needs to be additional investigation, determines if charges should be filed, determines if charges should not be filed, or if some sort of informal uh, procedure can uh, be uh, can be used to deal with the case, things, you know, various natures like that. But that's generally what our office does. And then for cases that are filed, um, you know, the cases in terms of making court appearances and all of that, our office would uh, participate in that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other question for the district attorney's office from, uh, from commissioners? And we'll call for public comment uh, at the end of this agenda item after all the partners have given their updates. Okay. Uh, then um, moving on to the, uh, to the next update, good, good transition. Um, to probation since uh, Ms. Cho mentioned uh, pr where that probation is, uh, is part of that process. Um, I will call on um, Melanie Stoffer. Hello everyone, happy new year. It's nice to see all of you. So to kind of piggyback on what Ms. Cho and um, Judge Cadet had shared, 
is that our families and um, youth are attending court via Zoom unless they really want to be present in court. And so we've also made some internal changes um, for our staff that they can telework from home um, if they have enough work to do, which in most cases they do. And we continue to check in with our youth and families to, just to make sure that everybody's doing okay. And um, we understand that with, with school, things are changing every day. So just trying to provide that additional support to the families. Currently, we're not going out into the field unless they're essential visits, because again, we wanna just reduce the amount of exposure that we have to other people, not only for ourselves, but also for our families. Um, so that's, I would say in a nutshell, how we're addressing the surge in, um, excuse me, <clears throat> in, um, COVID. And sorry, I'm apologizing for my voice. It's a little raspy today. <laughs> in terms of our numbers, and I'll give a little bit of context to the data that I report out on just for anyone that's new here is we give an overview of some of our stats for everyone here in the group. Um, and I'll just explain a little bit more about what each data point means. Um, we don't have any youth in placement, which for us is a good thing because that means that no kids have been removed um, from their homes to be placed in congregate care, which is um, essentially a group home. We're always happy to report out on that number. Uh, we have six youth that have transitioned from when they were previously in placement to non-minor dependent status. And what that means is that um, youth are eligible for extended foster care services up to the age of 21. And they receive um, not only financial support, but housing support. And then our probation officer that's in the placement unit provides case management support. We have three youth who are currently on um, an informal contract, which means not court ordered. And so anytime we get a police referral or a youth who's been detained in the juvenile hall, we can assess that youth and determine if we wanna go ahead and put them on a contract without probation, uh, court ordered probation involvement. So we have three youth on a six month contract um, and we also provide resources, case management services, and counseling services. Then we have a total of, and our numbers have continued to trend down in our supervision units. We have 124 uh, youth on either court ordered, these are all, all court ordered cases, six months of informal probation, uh, deferred entry of judgment, which is a year, and then formal probation, which can last anywhere from six months to a year or a little bit longer. It just depends. Um, and all of those youth also receive uh, counseling services, case management services, support from probation. We have four youth that are still in DJJ and um, I don't have the actual uh, potential parole dates, parole board uh, dates for those youth, but we anticipate within the next couple of years, we're gonna see um, most of, all, probably all of those youth coming back to us. Um, and then we will be providing services to them as well. We have 18 uh, juvenile probation officers and um, 19 youth on electronic monitoring. Those are kids that are not on probation and are on probation. So it could be that the court released a youth on EMP pending their court hearing. So 19 youth total. And then um, going back to our data about youth that we are serving um, in our intake. So assessment center investigations unit, which is intake. And then um, the officers will also make a recommendation to the court if they have a pending disposition hearing. We have 107 youth that are being served through, through the assessment center investigations unit. And then there's a question that comes up about um, um, race. Uh, 56% of our youth are Hispanic or Latino um, descent and 
then the numbers vary from there, but that's um, the highest percentage of youth that we serve. So those are the main data points. If y'all have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Commissioner Enriquez. Yeah, thank you for that information. I see that the numbers have gone up um, for the uh, youth uh, serving assessment centers investigation unit and also um, it went from four youth at DJJ uh, from last month to like 19. Um, so I'm seeing an increase there. Um, I'm wondering if you have, um, do you know, or I'm not sure if you guys keep this data somewhere, um, you know, of the youth, uh, what areas of, I guess, um, of cities and, and beats do you guys keep track of? Do you guys have that information? So I, I just wanted to go back to one thing that you mentioned. Did you say that you heard me say 19 kids at DJJ? Yes, 19 oh. youth on sorry, yeah. 19 youth on EMP. 19 youth on EMP, yes. Mm -hmm. And the same four uh, youth that we have at DJJ are still there. Yes, yes. Um, okay. And then yes, you're correct. We did see an increase in the numbers in the assessment center investigations unit. And that's not uncommon because we kids did go back to school. And so there can be school related issues that pop up. Um, or, you know, I think just the stress that our kids have been under being homeschooled and then going back into a formal school setting, uh, I think has created a lot of, of stress. And there could be other reasons as well. But you are correct. We did see a, an increase in our assessment center investigation unit numbers. Um, in terms of the question that you have about do we keep track of our of beats, are you talking about um, specific areas where we're supervising gang-related youth? Is that what you're referring to? Yes, yes. So if you could provide like out of San Mateo County, um, you know, how many of these youths are youth are coming from places like Daly City, Redwood City, North Fair Oaks. Um, just, I, I think that it would be helpful to have that um, data presented if you guys have it. I'm not sure if you guys keep track of that. Yeah, overall, what I can say is that we see more youth who are gang related coming from um, Daly City, South City, East Palo Alto, Redwood City. And I know last year I had shared um, a link to the Applied Survey Research Local Action Plan. And there is um, some demographic information in there. I can always share that again, if that would be helpful for you to reference. And that might give you a little bit more information as well. Okay, awesome, thank you. Yeah, that would be helpful uh, just for also the public to just uh, have that resource. Sure, no problem. Uh, Commissioner Boca Negra, I see your hand up. Yes. Uh, I have a quick question as well as a follow-up. Uh, is there any way that, that you keep track of uh, the youth that are being arrested? Uh, if, they are, if they have co-defendants that are adults, like the crimes that are being committed while they are arrested, are they committing these crimes with adults? Do we keep track of that information? And um, I had another question, but I might have to, have to wait. That, that was the pressing one to find out. Um, whether you keep track of which juveniles are being arrested alongside of adults that uh, they are co-defendants to in the same case. Yeah, so there isn't a formal tracking system for that. However, what we do know is that we don't have a lot of cases where youth have adult co-defendants. Um, once we receive a police report, if there is an adult co-defendant associated with the case, um, we have the information in the actual report that we reference that information, but in terms of a formal tracking system, uh, we don't have that. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Rasmussen. Thank you. I have a question similar to um, Commissioner Bocanegras. Do we keep track of gang involvement like with these um, with these cases? Is there a way to track whether or not the child has any gang involvement? Yeah, we have, I think, two or three officers who have their intensive cases, but some of the cases are gang-related cases. 
Um, so we are aware of how many youth in the division have gang orders. Um, it's not very many. And it might even be reflected in that local action plan report that I can um, you know, put in the chat. But I can certainly look into that if that's helpful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I have a follow up to that there. Uh, these youth that are documented gang members, do they face gang enhancements every time uh, they are apprehended or accused of a crime? Uh, are you aware of, of how that, uh, that gang title uh, is being utilized for our kids here in the county? Yeah, so that's a good question. The youth would have to be, um, when arrested, would have to be charged with an enhancement. And then it would be up to the DA's office whether or not they actually file a gang enhancement. So there's specific criteria that would have to be met for the DA to file a gang enhancement. And um, then if, if the youth does have a sustained gang enhancement, we can recommend gang orders. Um, but again, I don't think that we have a large amount of youth with active gang orders. I think it's a handful. Right. And so... Uh, for the adult system, how they utilize this, uh, what they refer to it as the gang validation. Um, it appears that we are mirroring some of the same policies that are being used by the adult supervision. Now, there is an exit to become disassociated with the gang. What is the criteria, if any, or if any has ever been discussed? Uh, at what point can we remove this gang title from, from these kids? Like, is there a, a point where we say, okay, our programs have restored these kids and it's appropriate to remove this title? Or do they remain labeled a gang member for the rest of their life here in our county? So that, I, I can't really speak to the adult side, um, Paul. What I can tell you though is if a youth does have active gang orders, we do everything that we can to work with the youth to hopefully get them to make better decisions or, you know, to support them around leaving the gang if, if that's what they want to do. Um, once they're terminated from probation, and this answers, I think, the second part of your question, um, we don't use the word label. If, if a youth is terminated for probation and they don't have a 707B offense, um, then they can certainly have their records sealed. And in a lot of cases, um, kids do have their records sealed. So unless they're going out and saying, you know, I'm a gang member, you know, um, we don't, that's not our process to label the kids, um, especially once they're terminated from probation because they don't have any interaction with us after that. All right, thank you so much, Melanie. Um, I wanna keep us moving along uh, to- um... Monroe, I just had one quick question about the, um, whether the numbers of youth actually at Youth Services Center had changed or whether that's been stable in Camp Camp. I think we're gonna get that in our next update from- oh, okay, uh, all right. Clark. Right. Oh, perfect. Yeah. The other part of our probation update uh, is from our superintendent at the Youth Service Center, um, Ms. Clark. Hi, Ms. Clark, go ahead. Hi, good evening. Um, yes, yeah, so we currently have 18 youth in custody and we have zero girls at camp. Um, as far as Omicron or just COVID in general, you know, we've been um, just following guidance from correctional health. Um, thankfully, we haven't had any youth that have been impacted. Um, of course, we've had some staff and things like that, but we have really strict safety measures in place, um, really um, just making sure that staff and youth are socially distanced. We've issued the youth, um, the N95 masks. Um, and as far as like visits and outside service providers, um, we have put it back onto a virtual platform. Um, just until we kind of things level out a little bit and we'll be in conversation with correctional health to see when we're, we're going to open it back up. Um, but they are in school in person. Um, yeah, is there any questions? Okay, 
Thank you. Oh, oh, we, have, uh, we do have a question from Commissioner, Commissioner Rasmussen, and, and maybe before I hand that off, I just wanted to say um, that's pretty remarkable given how, how much Omicron is spreading, uh, that you've had no cases. So yeah, thank yeah. You um, Commissioner Rasmussen. It's always nice to see you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I just had a very quick question. So has all visiting now returned to um, Zoom visiting for families? Yes, for the time being, is it's really it's been that way this past um, the past two weeks. Um, we were going to open back up, but just erring on the side of caution, we decided to um, still keep it at a virtual platform at least for another week or two. Um, but once we kind of get the clearance, we'll we'll resume in person visits. Uh, Commissioner Enriquez. Yeah, uh, very quickly. Um, what is the girls camp being, um, you know, I see that there's zero girls there. So what do you guys are using camp, you know, since it's empty? What do you guys? Do? So we still have our girls empowerment programs. So there aren't girls there physically as, as far as like um, part of with the girls orders where they would be qualified to sleep there, but we do um, still have girls coming in, or youth, I should say, coming in from the community daily, um, Monday through Friday for school, for a therapeutic programming and for, and for therapy. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much, Ms. Clark. Yes. And so Ms. Clark, uh, I have a question for you on that. I assume then from what you're saying that none of those girls are from Sonoma County. We did have some girls from Sonoma County in the past. Yes, all the youth from Sonoma County um, have graduated, but they're part of the program. Um, I will say, um, I'm glad you mentioned that we have and we are looking into um, an MOU with Santa Cruz County. Um, that's still kind of um, in the works, but we'll know probably in the coming month or so what that status is. I'll probably report it, if not next meeting, the one after. Uh, I have a quick question as to that. And how you doing, Ms. Clark? It's always Hi. a pleasure to see you. Happy New Year. Uh, when you say Santa Cruz County, are we referring to DJJ kids that uh, are being rerouted and outsourced no. now to a no. different county? No, not at all. Okay. Um, yeah, we're, we're not in the um, DJJ or secure youth track business, <laughs> I should that's say. Why, that's why <laughs> I love the work that you do, Ms. Clark. You are awesome. <laughs> Thank you. That's so, right. yeah, no, this is, again, just what we've been doing um, with the Sonoma youth. So, you know, youth that are identified, right, that have, you know, that need, have therapeutic needs. Yes. needs and, and things like that, um, we've expanded it to Santa Cruz, but no, not anybody that's DJJ or a secure track eligible. Thank you, you're, you're awesome, appreciate that. <laughs> All right, I think that's a good uh, transition since we mentioned uh, therapeutic services. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Um, transition to uh, Ms. Pena uh, from BHRS. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you all. Aurora Pena, Supervising Mental Health Clinician with the Behavioral Health and Recovery Services Department. And um, as mentioned, we provide the individual and family therapy for youth in the juvenile hall and some families that have been court ordered that are in the community. So um, we can just given the restrictions out of, you know, um, as Ms. Clark mentioned, keeping everybody safe, the youth and the staff, we've reverted to the uh, telehealth or telephone um, modality to provide services just until we get the okay from correctional health to return back in person. Um, it's great that, you know, this option still continues um, to be able to stay connected to youth and families. Um, I know that, I mean, just given the Omicron, our, our team has been affected. Um, so this platform allows for them to continue the flow of work, whether they're, you know, having to stay out of the office because of a possible exposure or, um, you know, whatnot. So it's great that the flow of work hasn't been disrupted as a result of this. Um, although some of our community families, we are learning that, you know, entire families have tested positive for COVID, you know, or families renting a room. And then, you know, the other three families that are also sharing, you know, room, renting rooms from that one home, are tested so you could have seven nine people 
who have tested positive. And so trying to keep the youth safe. Um, you know, we've also done outreach because we fall under the health department. We were asked to help just um, not to pressure any of the community members to get vaccinated, but really just make ourselves available to answer questions and provide information and resources. So I know that some youth have gone from absolutely being against it to after getting more information, having more conversation with parents, um, or even just the breakout, you know, having uh, gotten it maybe, and now it's like, oh yeah, I don't want to ever experience this again. So we've been able to connect them to different testing sites and um, vaccination sites. So um, yeah, so I mean, the, the families in the community continue to be affected, um, affected by Omicron in a, you know, in a big way, um, where, as I mentioned, the youth are, you know, some youth are, you know, COVID positive for a second time and so forth. So um, it's, it's rough on them. It's rough on them. Any questions? All right, um, thank you so much, Aurora. Uh, and if there are no questions, um, we'll move on to our uh, to our next update from the County Office of Education. I know I saw Janae Luttrell. Good evening. Hi. Hi, um, my name is Janae Luttrell and I'm the Deputy Superintendent of Educational Services for San Mateo County Office of Education. So if I may, I'll start with Omicron in general for the education field in San Mateo County. Um, while we do offer and were robustly built up our, our technology services during um, COVID, many of you are aware that the state of California took distance learning off of the table as an option for educational programs. So with that said, we have schools open and functioning as best as they can every day, but they're dealing with lots of increase in cases of Omicron. So in some cases, um, we have superintendents subbing in classrooms. We have almost all the district staff that have been deployed to try to cover and meet the needs of the classrooms, which is the right work to do. And it's also really taxing on, on everyone, including our students and families. So um, hopefully we'll get on the other side of the surge, but um, I'm really happy to say that uh, we have PPE deployed out to the school sites. We um, we're able to get tests, home tests from public health and get them deployed out to the schools during the winter break, et cetera. So, so grateful for all of our partners in San Mateo County that help us help the schools, all 115 schools, keep our students and staff safe. But please know that in many cases, they're not um, able to function at full capacity because of, you know, decrease in staffing, et cetera. So switching to our programs connected to um, the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Commission, um, to echo what Ms. Clark's report was, we do have, um, right now we have 16 youth enrolled in Hillcrest, so we must have some folks that are in Hillcrest that aren't students um, at this time. Um, we have four, four students that are enrolled in GEP at Kemp. And right now there are 12 students being served at Canyon Oaks. So that's a pretty high number for Canyon Oaks. Um, right now we have 19 students enrolled in Gateway um, Community School. But one other really important detail that I wanted to share with all of you is that um, as I've been sharing over time, we've been serving students at Gateway for districts, primarily through the expulsion pathway, but oftentimes through the disciplinary pathway, not always meeting the threshold of expulsion. And um, our enrollment just significantly declined and made it really problematic to, to run the robust program that we were hoping to run. So in this year, we were really fortunate to be able to pursue um, some grant funds, while we didn't get the grant funds, it really created a whole kind of momentum of school staff, et cetera, looking at what would an ideal community school entail? What would it, what would that look like? And how would we ask, offer robust academics as well as strong mental health supports and really you know, have a restorative, more therapeutic space? So that being said, we built the model. We were able to get some one-time funds through the state of California and brought them to Gateway. And we're really excited about this new model that we were offering. And with that being said, um, we have never passed the threshold of, we've just once passed the threshold of 20. 
So we were really anticipating having, especially in, in conversation with our districts prior to this new school year starting, a large increase of students that would be would benefit from the gateway program. And um, I do believe that's the case, but we never received the referrals. And because Gateway is not a school on its own, we are, we're not an LEA, we're not a school district, we are a school program. And so districts have to opt to use our services. Um, and, and so it's not parent choice. There's no, you know, no other way to get access to Gateway and, unless they get a referral through the district. We um, had to make the hard business decision to really look at our program and, and make the consideration of no longer offering the program moving forward. And so while we, we feel we're heartbroken about losing such an important program and we're so proud of the work that our staff have done, not only this year, but <clears throat> excuse me, over the whole you know, time period that we've been open, we have hit that point in time, <clears throat> excuse me, Having said that, one of the things that does also get me a little excited, frankly, is that in the conversations with the districts, you know, these are students that came from the districts. And if we can help the districts better expand or maybe create some new ways to support students that weren't always able to be served and, and keep the students closer to home, that would be ideal. So in this, as I would say, a crisis tunity of, of funding and referrals, et cetera, if we have to close the program, I'm really hoping that some silver lining will come out of it and we can work with the districts to help support those students at home. Uh, hi, I just wanted to make sure I understood this. So you aren't currently canceling the Gateway program? Gateway will still function for the school year. For but, this school year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the plan is at the end of this school year, unless something radically changes, the program will be discontinued. Correct. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Enriquez. Yes, thank you, um, Jimmy, for that uh, report. I'm wondering if you guys have applied to the um, to the new funding opportunities, like the social isolation funding and also the learning recovery, um, social isolation, the one-time funding. I'm wondering if you if if Gateway qualifies for that or is that is that just for districts? Good question. There are some funds. I don't know in particular. I can tell you that our team has been watching and we've either pursued applied for every fund funding source that we were eligible to apply for or we were just awarded in one time funds in just regular allocations based on on our enrollment. However, um, we do know that there are some more grants that are coming down, but with the timing of schools, unfortunately, if we write a grant in the spring and we don't find out till late spring, um, if we have to notice staff, we have to notice all staff prior to March 15th. And historically, that typically was, you, you know, districts had to notice credentialed staff teachers, et cetera. Um, there was a law that changed the state this year and it requires us to notice all staff, certificated and classified. So as you can imagine, that really puts an, an unfortunate amount of pressure pretty early in, in, you know, here we are in January having to do our best crystal ball predict, prediction of what things will look like. And, you know, we spent a lot of time really analyzing our referrals, talking to our districts. And at this time, it does not look like um, we would have upped our referrals significant enough to be able to have a cost efficient model at Gateway. Um, so I can't speak to the, the isolation one is the one fund that I, I can't speak to whether we applied or not, but I can tell you the other COVID dollars, um, our board and, and our superintendent were really generous. We received um, some funds in the form of AB 86. And as a county office of ed, we had a variety of different ways that we could have chosen to use those funds. But our, our board and our superintendent decided to allocate about seven to $800,000 to Gateway this year with the hopes of trying to revamp this model and pivot into it. And, and yet um, those are one-time funds, one funds, so it's not sustainable. And unfortunately, looking forward, we have to um, you know, make some of those hard, hard decisions that have to get made. 
but I can tell you it wasn't easy for anybody and it's it it is a loss and I can also say that again I think there's some opportunities here we've seen over the years it, you know for some of those folks who may not be aware there were times in Gateway that Gateway was 80 to 100 kids. We had quite a significant enrollment. And similar to our other school programs connected to JJDPC, and we've seen a decline. And part of that's because of, you know, cost of living. Part of it, frankly, is, in my opinion, really positive that school districts have expanded their ability to meet a broader range of students. And so more students are able to be housed and served in their community connected to their own neighborhoods. And um, we're proud of the work we've done at Gateway, but it looks like it's just maybe come at a time that it's it's no longer the right fit for our community. Got it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that information. Um, super, super interesting. Um, and I'll just I'll pass it over to the other commissioners through the chair. I think Commissioner Wilson had her hand up, yep. So, um, Janae, thanks for coming. Um, when we were doing the school inspection, you talked about all the therapeutic services you were going to be putting into Gateway and also into the other schools. And I just thought it would be useful to have an update on how that re-envisioning of a therapeutic model has gone and, and what of that will stay once Gateway leaves in the other facilities. May, um, could I, could, hey, uh, Commissioner Wilson, could I make this suggestion yep. that maybe- That I chat you, with Janae one-on-one? -on -one? No, no, no. I think it's a good question for the public to know, but uh, but maybe we could get a longer update in February. Uh, sure. What do you think about that? I'm fine. Ms. Luttrell? Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah, just in the interest of time, I think I mean, that that sounds like a very worthwhile update, but it might take more time than we really have right now. We're a little behind schedule. Yeah, okay. Uh, Commissioner Rasmussen, I saw your hand up, but did you put it down? Yeah, we put it down. Okay, okay, great. Well, um, Janae, thank you so much for that update. And um, that is interesting news, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing a little bit more about it next month. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and our last update from our partners is uh, is from Child and Family Services, um, John Fong, but I don't see him on right now. I know that, uh, I know that he had reached out to me ahead of time. So it looks like um, looks like we don't have an update from him. Uh, so we will try to get that into the next meeting and um, and uh, and maybe a written report between now and then. So let's keep moving uh, on the agenda. Uh, actually, sorry. Before I do that, I should call for public comment on this agenda item. Are there any members of the public who? wish to comment on uh, on the updates. You can raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, then um, we'll keep we'll keep moving. Um, the next item on the agenda is item four. And it's at this point, just a little over an hour into our two hours that um, that we'll move on to the uh, the the topics of our annual meeting. So our operating policies say that uh, every January we should have a, an annual meeting uh, in which we do three things. We adopt the operating policies of the commission. We review the, uh, our activities from the previous year uh, and we discuss our vision for the next year. Uh, so the first two of those things are what or what I included in uh, agenda item four, the adoption of the operating policies. And then we also received from our previous co-chairs, Talaria and, uh, and Tony Barrick, the, their annual report um, on 2020, on the activities of 2021. Um, both of those things, the operating policies and the uh, annual report are in the agenda packet and were distributed ahead of time. So, um, so, my hope was that uh, we could quickly adopt those uh, so that we can get on to talking about the future uh, and our plans for 2022. Um, so maybe to start out, uh, 
I would entertain a motion. Yes, uh, hang on, Melissa, yep. one second. If we want to have some discussion on the operating policy, we'll start with the operating policies. If we want to have some discussion on that, what I would ask is that is that a commissioner make a motion to adopt the operating policies, uh, and we get a second, and then and then we can have some discussion on it. Uh, and if there's any edits or anything like that, then we can then we can do that. I motion we adopt the operating policies. You move that we adopt. I move, it. yes, <laughs> yes. Second. Okay, now here's how I want to change it. Uh, I um, yes, go ahead. Okay, so I feel and have felt for a long time that there are two flaws in our operating policies, and one is that attendance uh, commissioners are required to notify if they can't be in attendance, but anything is uh, any notice like five minutes before the meeting is okay. And I think that there should be a little bit more rigor about notification, unless it's extraordinary circumstances or family emergency, et cetera. The second sure. thing I'd like to see is we don't address project participation at all. And that being part of what qualifies or disqualifies you as a commissioner. And I'm saying this based on having done membership last year and the areas where we had trouble the, our policy doesn't reflect reality, which is the reality is there sometimes people just don't come to meetings or they they don't come having given five minutes advance warning to the chair. Get ready, Monroe. When you say come to meetings there, you meet, you meant come to say subcommittee meetings. Subcommittee meetings. Yep. Okay. But then also sometimes commissioners give almost no notice and it's kind of automatically excused as long as you text Monroe right before the meeting and it shouldn't really be like that so I sent you a draft of what the youth on the youth leadership team for peer court created mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a model that I think we should follow okay um so is there something uh I'll, I'll ask if other commissioners have questions about um about Commissioner Wilson's suggested edits but but melissa could you maybe be a little more specific like where in the operating policies you would insert something and and, and what you want to say um i could give you the text i i could draft up some text for you um i hoped you would just take the text from the commission the youth leadership team and insert it basically it would say 24 hours notice for non-attendance Right. But what I, I guess what I'm saying is that if we want to act on that now, right, make a motion to make that change and adopt that as part of the operating policy now, mm -hmm. then um, then we need something specific that okay. the commission can vote on. I could write something during the meeting to come back to at the end of the meeting. I think maybe I think what I I think maybe what I would suggest is is instead of doing it on the fly right now, yeah. um, that that while we we while it, it, i don't think we're restricted to only the january meeting to be able to make yeah. uh, you know changes to the operating policy mm -hmm. and um and so i hear you that's a that uh, on that idea mm -hmm. um but why don't you come to the february meeting with something more specific like so okay. th that we can actually you know and tangible no actually vote on no problem okay Great. Was there, sorry, before we go on to others, were there any comments or clarifying questions from Melissa on her idea? Okay. I, have, I have a comment. Yeah, please. Um, Melissa, I think it would properly belong in the section Article 2G, regular attendance, mm -hmm. and H, commissioners in good standing. Uh -huh. And so I would be happy to work with you on appropriate language that we could propose to the next meeting. To that reflect awesome. those ideas. You got it, Karen. Thanks. Great. All right. Um, Commissioner Rasmussen, I saw your hand up. I assume it's about a, diff a different po topic regarding the operating policies. It is. Thank you, Monroe. So I have um, about 10 different um, things I'd like to, uh, that I'd like to, you know, put out there, but I, I'm wondering what the best way to do that would be if maybe I should follow Melissa's lead and um, be prepared to include it in the agenda packet for next month? What I'm thinking is that if you have that many things uh, and Melissa has a couple uh, and you know, then there might be some others that the, that the best way to handle this 
uh, as a commission is to form a subcommittee that works on this between now and the February meeting and comes back to the commission with some suggested changes. Uh, and, you know, instead of kind of doing all the work right here, um, mm -hmm. I think we can get a subcommittee together and I would be happy to help facilitate that. Uh, and since you have the ideas, Melissa has some ideas, definitely you will, I'll reach out to the two of you. Mm -hmm. um, and if there are other commissioners who would like to participate, uh, I'm looking at our vice chair of administration. Yeah, so I, I would like, I would definitely like to participate. Like a, uh, an area, um, mm -hmm. then, um, then please reach out to me after the meeting. Sounds great. Thank you, Monroe. Okay, good. Uh, Susan, I saw your hand up, but it came down. You've actually taken care of what I was concerned about. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, well then, um, instead of adopting the, op uh, adopting the operating policies anew right now, it sounds like we have enough suggested changes that uh, I would entertain a motion to form a subcommittee to review the operating policies and bring back to the commission in February some uh, suggested changes. I second that. Okay, well, I guess I just made the motion and then you second. Okay, great. great. I don't know how this stuff works. That's why I'm never gonna <laughs> I didn't quite. Chair. I didn't quite phrase it right. Uh, so, so then any public comment on that or any other questions from commissioners before we move to a vote? No, all right. Uh, I would say let's call for a voice vote on this. I have a feeling we're also gonna get a lot of uh, of assent. So commissioners, you could come off of um, mute. And uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone, uh, anyone uh, not in favor of forming the subcommittee? Any abstentions? Okay, good. A committee is formed. I will, as the chair, um, be the one to uh, make sure we put it together. And uh, Commissioners Wilson and Rasmussen and Hubert Levy, at least, I will definitely reach out to you all. Anyone else who's interested in participating, please contact me. All right, uh, then we're moving past uh, our operating policies uh, for now, uh, tabling that till February. And the other item is the um, the annual report that was submitted by our former co-chairs, Telria and, and Barrick. So uh, it, it isn't required by the annual, uh, by our operating policies that, um, that we have a vote on this. Uh, it, the only thing that says is that we should review our previous year, which the annual report does. So um, you've all had a chance to read that. And again, in the interest of time, I would say, um, I would just move toward and not not make a motion, but just ask any discussion or questions or comments about the annual report. Susan. Uh, I have two changes I would like. Uh, one on page six, where we talk about recruiting more youth commissioners. I think the fact that we actually do have the two that we're supposed to is something is an achievement that other juvenile justice and delinquency prevention commissions have been unable to achieve. And I think it's, it should be noted in our annual report. Uh, and the other one is on page seven on identifying diversion programs. They said it's 95% complete. Well, the interviews are complete, but the analysis and the writing of the report is still ahead. So I would say that 80% would be more accurate than 95%. <laughs> okay. Other than that, I think it's great. Great. Um, terrific. Any other, uh, Commissioner Rasmus, I see your hand up. Thank you. So um, I have a, um, just an addition um, in the project where we mentioned the social media program. I'd like to insert there that we also created a social media working group. That's something that we did mm -hmm. in that, so I'd like that addition. And then I would also like uh, for consideration 
um, if we could possibly um, add the words under in the strategy uh, section two, um, if we could add in the words gang intervention and prevention. Sorry, where is that in, uh, can you read the section that you're suggesting adding that to? Um, I can, Eight I make a number would help. Yeah, just trying to understand uh, if it changes okay. the substance of it or, or okay, not. Okay, let, let yeah. me pull that up here. Um, so I have it under strategy, strategy number two. So that would be on page, Strategy. It's page five. Thank you so much, Susan. I appreciate that. I write a cheat sheet before my meetings of all my notes, and so I didn't have the page number. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. So page number five. So um, I believe it is. Um, well, wait. Maybe it's not on my number five here. I don't see that on page number five. Do you want it? Is there someone else that wants to speak before me and I, you can come back to me? Sure, we'll come back okay, to you. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments on the annual report? Good, Johanna, I think you're still on the hot seat. <laughs> All right, well, I'll go ahead and withdraw that then. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Then uh, I think I heard a couple of suggestions from Susan and then one from, uh, from Johanna. They all sounded like good uh, additions to me. Uh, so if there are no objections to making those changes and adopting the annual report provided by our former co-chairs, then by general consent, I would like to adopt that annual report with those amendments. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so that is, it is uh, it definitely members of the public, it's in the agenda packet. It will be posted also on our, on our website. I encourage you to read about all the good work that the commission has gotten done in the last year. Uh, and so that takes care of those two parts of our requirements for our annual meeting in January. The third, and now the, uh, you know, the most substantive of what we need to engage in uh, for our annual meeting is to talk about our vision for the future. Uh, and, and so um, in order to do that, what I would like to do is just to share my screen and show show you uh, the the mission and aspirations of the um, of the commission, and um, and then we can, as commissioners, have a discussion about those missions and the mission and aspirations, uh, and then hopefully we're also going to have time to get to our projects uh, and uh, and. In the past, what we've done, the past couple of years, what we've done is we formed a strategic planning subcommittee. That committee went out and kind of did the work to make all the suggestions to the changes in the projects and so forth. And deliberately this year, I, I, I wanted to uh, engage all the commissioners in this discussion. Um, so hopefully we can, we can do that in an orderly way and you know, get through it in the next half an hour or so. Um, but, but uh, I wanted to make sure that everyone had time to think about it and um, and provide some input if if we want to make any additions or changes or anything. So um, before I do that, I see Karen, your hands up. Did you have a question before before I? I just had a quick procedural point. Did we yeah, second your motion to approve the annual report? I uh, approved it by general consent, which doesn't okay. require a second. There was no okay, motion. Okay, I said, perfect. if there are no objections. Okay. Cause, thank you. Then approve. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but we'll, we'll go on. So let's, let me share my screen and uh, we will look at the mission and the aspirations of the commission. 
So it's the mission of the San Mateo County Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevent Commission to be a public conscience in the best interests of juveniles. Uh, the commission advocates for programs and services that prevent youth entry into the juvenile justice system and promotes respect for the human dignity of all minors who do enter the system. So uh, let's have some discussion um, and I will, I'm gonna stop the share so we can all see each other. But uh, commissioners, are, do you have any questions about our mission? Do you have any comments on the mission? Is there anything that you would change? Melissa, I see your physical hand going up. Yes. <laughs> your virtual hand, please. Um, I recommended this in my feedback notes to you, Monroe, that I think that human dignity is awesome, but I think that we should actually put something in that says like re restorative services. So why don't you, why don't you kind of read it back to me? Like, what would you, what would you say? Sorry, Melissa, we've got to be specific, specific on what we're, on what we're suggesting to change. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Uh, I have to open my document. Shoot, I don't have. So, so we say that we say that we advocate for programs and services that prevent youth entry into the juvenile justice system, and we promote respect for the human dignity. So, right. are you saying that we promote... also want to advocate for programs and services? Yes, I think we should be a little more explicit about the fact that we want programs and services that are restorative and make you know let them exit and become healthy adults for the youth who do enter the system. Yes. Uh, so what if we said the commission advocates for programs and services that prevent youth entry into the juvenile justice system and that promote respect for the human dignity of all minors who do enter the system? Meaning we advocate for programs and services for the minors that are entering, that are in the system as well. How about instead of human dignity, utilizing youthful dignity, because that is what we're representing, the youthful part of our community members who we hope will reach adulthood without entering the criminal justice system that at times sees them as adults when they are in fact kids. Mm. So you're saying promotes respect for the youthful dignity of all minors who do enter the system? Mm but keep still keep Melissa's services. Yes, mandate got that part yeah. too, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, Commissioner Rasmussen, I see your hand up. Did you wanna, I just wanna make sure, um, did you wanna comment on Melissa or Paul's suggestions or did you have something new? I have something new. Why don't we, why don't we see if anyone else has any comment or questions about Melissa's and Paul's suggestions first? Susan. Uh, I think human dignity is a more respectful term to use. Uh, youthful dignity, I don't think has much meaning to most people and acts as though they are lesser than an adult with dignity. Uh, I, I think human dignity is, is, the, is the better terminology to use. Sort of like human rights. Yeah, yeah, one, of, yeah one of the things we, we asked um, the young people in the Youth Commission several years ago what we could do that would make it more attractive to be part of, to be a liaison or to be a youth commissioner. And the most specific comment they said was stop calling us kids. We're not, we're not youthful goats. Um, so I've made a, an effort to refer to them as youth or students or you know, something other than, you know, kids, kids. <laughs> right, right. Right. Anyone else have any questions or comments on, on those two ideas? I think what we represent here is when we strip youth of their youth, right? We forfeit that, which is entitled to them by God. We forfeit that through our policies and our legislation. And I think it's important to highlight the fact that we do represent the youthful dignity of our youth here in our county. Uh, again, that's just my lived experience. I've had my youth 
ripped away by this juvenile criminal justice system. And again, that, I'm just voicing my opinion here. Well, I, I, would, I would support putting that in a separate sentence. Yeah, that's, that's how I would handle it. And, and something to the effect, sorry, can you maybe rephrase like what, how, how it would, what kind of separate sentence that would be? I mean, something to the effect of ensure that youth have have, have a youth. <laughs> that, yeah, that, yeah have, that, that we preserve people, their youth. That juveniles do not have their youth stripped from them or something to that effect. I'm, right. Maybe that sounds to, awesome. Maybe That's we need awesome. to think about that. And uh, again, maybe the same committee that is looking at the policies could maybe it's or maybe a separate one yeah or so uh, one. yeah let's hold on that for a second um great. I think this is something that needs to have careful thought yeah and yeah. Not, be, not be done quickly uh commissioner rasmussen you had another suggestion for the mission oh i think you're on mute uh, am i off of mute now it looks like you are yes thank yes. you thank you i'm sorry um, so I would like to add um, where we're talking about pro Melissa's programs and services. And then after Paul's or after that sentence, mm -hmm. um, I would like to where we say that we advocate for programs and services, prevent entry into the system. I would like to add um, and reduce youth incarceration, please. Mm. So, so um, again, it sounds like we're going to probably form a small committee to get to the exact wording, but just for the record, so we're clear, could you clarify a little bit where you meant to put the... Um, sure. So if I could just read where it is now, because it, sure. it's hard to input the new language, so I'll just read where it is now. Yeah. So it, it would be... Um, the commission advocates for programs and services that prevent youth entry into the juvenile justice system, reduce youth incarceration, and promote respect for the human dignity of all minors who entered the system. Right, right. Okay. Any questions or comments for Commissioner Rasmussen on that suggestion? From commissioners. I'm okay with it. Yeah. All right. So we have, um, oh, Commissioner Enriquez, go ahead. Yeah, I just think that um, we should form whatever committee. I think this will take more time. I would like to add my own uh, comments and thoughts when I think about reading this mission. Okay. Uh, because ever since that I became a commissioner since last year, I feel that I have not been given the opportunity to advocate for programs and services um, in addition to what is being done right now at the moment. So I, I think that if we could form some type of subcommittee for this, um, it will be great. That's all. Thanks. Yeah. And just, just to clarify what you meant by that, um, uh, advocating for programs and services in addition to the projects that we're working on in the commission or in addition to say programs and services that are in the YSC? I'm just, just clarify what you meant by that. Yes, both. Um, you know, I, I know that the organizations right now that, you know, are, are serving the, the youth, you know, in, in the, you know, all these uh, YSCs, YSCs and, you know, services, I, I think that um, they've been serving there for a while. You know, I, I love, you know, the work that, you know, they do, but I would like to see more of that um, and right. kind of bring more innovative programs, um, you know, that are 2021 first century. Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Any other, before, before I, I'll try to, to sort of tie this, to tie up what we've, the suggestions we have on the table into a motion in a second. But before we do that, uh, does anyone else want to make, any other commissioners want to make any comment or ask any questions about the mission statement? Okay, great. So, 
So I, I, what I would suggest, and I guess I'll make a motion that we form a subcommittee to work on our mission statement uh, and to take under consideration um, the specific suggestions that we've heard today about reducing incarceration, advocating for programs and services for uh, kids in, sorry, for youth in the system, um, for, you know, preserving the youth and not having it stripped away. Uh, uh, and I think I captured them all right there, but we can, we will have minutes and we will have a recording to go back and, and double check. But, but, uh, and that this subcommittee reach out to, uh, to get input from commissioners. Uh, so, so the motion is to take these suggestions uh, and build on them if there are any others and work on this and come back to the commission uh, in February with a new mission statement. Do I have a second? I'll second that one, Ro. Thank you, Commissioner Rasmussen. Uh, are there any, uh, I should ask, is there any public comment? Is there, are there any members of the public that would like to say something about this mission statement and how we might wanna change it or not? Feel free to raise your hand. Yes, I see Kate Heaster from FLY. Uh, go ahead, please introduce yourself and go ahead. Hi there, good evening. Um, so yes, my name is Kate Heaster. I am the San Mateo County Director for Fresh Lifelines for Youth. Um, and just one thing I wanted to kind of throw out there for consideration is um, there are certainly conversations across the state around how we even define youth um, and sort of what, you know, what age actually sort of counts as youth versus adult. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of add that into the thinking for the subcommittee about how you all want to think about that and, and what you want to advocate for as far as that thinking. So just hmm. putting it out there. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kate. Anyone else, any other members of the public have input here? Okay, hearing none and no more discussion, uh, uh, I think I will call for a voice vote to form this subcommittee. And just again, to be clear, our operating policies uh, aren't specific about we don't need a vote as to who's on the subcommittee. Um, it's actually my responsibility as the chair to uh, to appoint the members of the subcommittee. But having heard, you know, the people who've spoken up tonight and are interested in making some changes, uh, I will I will be I will be in touch with you. Um, but I will get this subcommittee formed so that we have something more specific and considered to look at in the February meeting. Uh, and with that, I'll call for a voice vote from commissioners. If you could come off mute and all those in favor of forming the subcommittee to revise our mission statement to be presented at the February meeting. Aye. 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 Great. Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Great, the motion passes. I will be in touch about forming that subcommittee. And, um, before we move on to talking in the same way about our three aspiration statements and uh, sort of considering whether we should add any aspiration statements, um, I just wanted to say, I know this is a little, you know, it's, it's, it's not the best, it's not easy to kind of like make the sausage as we're going through uh, this, but uh, I still like this prefer this because we're getting an opportunity for all commissioners to weigh in uh, and for members of the public to give us their thoughts as well. Um, so even though we might not get to a tied up bow and a result today um, with a new mission statement, um, I'm confident we're gonna get there in February. And in the process, we've given more people an opportunity to weigh in So uh, and to do it in public and transparently. So thank you. Uh, let's, let's go on to talking about the aspirations of the commission. All right, I'm gonna share screen again. Here are our current aspirations. 
as a commission. For anyone who's new to, to the commission and hasn't seen this on our website, uh, these are the three aspirations that we wrote for ourselves two years ago and we updated uh, and we updated at the beginning of last year. Uh, the voices of communities most likely to be affected by the juvenile justice system are heard regularly by the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors and other elected officials in the county. Two, every youth who comes into contact with the San Mateo County Juvenile Justice System has convenient, affordable access to appropriate transitional mental health and substance abuse programs. And three, that all elementary and middle school children in underserved neighborhoods in San Mateo County have convenient, affordable access to programs that engage and support them after school and that provide services to address early childhood trauma as needed. So our three aspirations are focused on how we function as a commission and making sure voices of our uh, community that are most affected are heard uh, on delinquency prevention, prevention through after school programs specifically uh, and focused on those youth who do come into contact with the system and making sure that their mental health needs are addressed. Um, since we identified all of those areas as areas that are, um, are important in our strategic planning in past years. So let's open it up to discussion um, and suggestions from commissioners on both whether you would substantially change any of the aspirations and or add new aspirations. And um, to, uh, Commissioner Rasmussen, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Thank you. This was my number two I was looking for earlier in my notes. So this is the space that asked number two, um, where I wanted to insert the gang intervention and, and prevention. So that- okay. In the, sorry, when you say number two, you mean in the second aspiration? In the second aspiration, along with mental health services, I would like to add gang intervention and prevention. Ah, all right, wait, I'm gonna, uh... I don't know if I want to toggle back and forth, but it's helpful to have it. It up is helpful screen. to have it on the screen. Yeah, yeah. So one, maybe why don't I keep it up there, and then and thank then you, Monica. You can see each other on the uh, on the side there. Um, so you're saying every youth who comes into contact with San Mateo County Juvenile Justice has convenient, affordable access, appropriate to transitional mental health, and sorry, say it again. Gang intervention and prevention programs in addition to substance abuse programs, right, yes. got it. Yeah, gang intervention and prevention. Any, uh, that's pretty specific. And um, why don't we go on talking about whether or not there are any other suggestions on aspiration number two in particular. Um, uh, go ahead. My only comment is that transitional feels like it gets lost because it's a vague word. And when I think about appropriate transitional, I think of vocational education, for example, or a you know, pathway to college. And so I, I ask whether we should be a little bit more specific about that. Mm -hmm. So you would maybe replace- I, uh -huh. I think that's an addition because to me, transitional is helping the young person go from being in the hall to being successful back at, at his home school or her for mm -hmm. homeschool. So right. I think if we're going to talk about occupational uh, opportunities, I think that's that's still another one to be added. Mm -hmm. mm. And you're saying, Melissa, I think I heard you say vocational and educational. Pa yeah, a vocational or, or educational pathway. Right. In addition, okay. So can, why don't we uh, add that to the, what the subcommittee on the mission is going to do since the two the one kind of leads from the other yeah let me um that's a good point if we if we make changes to our mission then we might want to make changes to the aspirations mm -hmm. uh so so uh thank you susan i think that's a good suggestion that we not you know vote on specific changes to the aspirations right now um but i do want to say thank you to Johanna and Melissa for 
specific suggestions here because that's really helpful. I think we can, that makes the work easier to go back and, uh, and, and look at inserting those specific changes to aspiration number two. Uh, while we're on aspiration number two, anyone else have any comments or suggestions on that one? Okay, coming back to the first aspiration. Uh, we passed over that one, but um, but does any, did anyone have any suggested changes for that? Okay. I do like that one uh, personally. Um, what about aspiration number three? Okay, staying keeping our focus on on after school care as a way to uh, per, to uh, to serve our delinquency prevention mission. Um, Actually, kind of like, Monroe, could I say mm -hmm. something? I, yes, I was please. just wondering, I mean, I'm very committed to this aspiration and have done a lot of work on it and enjoyed um, doing the research on this area. But the one thing that kind of has just been in my, my head is what about um, high school students? You know, we're focused on the impact and the intervention early, which is super important. But also in high school, I think there is you know, a very real issue and need. Yeah, well, that's a good point. And, um, and I, I know from some discussion with other commissioners uh, that there's an interest in maybe adding an aspiration, um, perhaps on school to prison pipeline, which would be more focused on high school students. So, you know, I, I for context, this aspiration was written uh, deliberately and explicitly with um, younger children in mind. Um, with the, if we, if you read the whole of the strategic plan we wrote two years ago, there is an emphasis on the delinquency prevention side to start early. Uh, I totally agree with that. Yeah. So yeah. if we're if we're going to perhaps relate to the slightly older population with a different aspiration, then I think that's great. Yeah. Uh, Susan, please go ahead. One that I would suggest that would work with three is to work to remove barriers for graduation from high school, because a, a lot of the prop reason kids don't, young people don't graduate from high school is because of any number of problems. It can, it can come from having been suspended or um, expelled right. in elementary or middle school they can come from having to work to help support the family they can come from having uh, transportation problems i mean working on the projects i'm working on there there are a myriad of barriers and what needs to be addressed is to find out if a child is not going to school not going to high school mm. to find out why they're not going? Is it because they've fallen behind and they're embarrassed? Is it because they don't have the clothing that makes them feel like they can be accepted? Right. Uh, right. There, there are all kinds of reasons. And I think um, one of the things that we really do want to do is to ensure as far in as far as possible that all student, all of our students graduate from high school. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I think we're probably coalescing around uh, an additional aspiration that focuses on high school students on the on the school to prison pipeline, but you've also broadened it to um, to more than just that, right? Um, uh, I think more than what we usually understand by that, and um, uh, that's that's an interesting suggestion. Anyone have any further thoughts or comments on high school students and a possible fourth aspiration here? I have one on just number two. Uh, how about placing trauma-informed programs uh, there alongside of the substance abuse programs, as well as the gang prevention and awareness programs? That mm -hmm. um, because that is a, a critical component in the simulation out of a, a 
out of a complex trauma environment that many of our youth suffer uh, by the time they end up in our juvenile criminal justice system. Okay. Um, thanks, Paul. Uh, I see Ms. Newton's hand up and we'll hold on you until we come back to public comment, Sasha. Um, but uh, Roxana, your hand is up. Any mm -hmm. other thoughts on our aspirations? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, so I think that I would just add for aspiration number three, um, I know that it says all elementary and middle school, um, but I think it's important to also, you know, maybe specify what that means. I don't know. It's just because there is, um, you know, there, there are a lot of charter schools in our communities and they do serve a lot of underserved students. Um, so I think that often those charter schools are left out just because they're not under the umbrella, even though they are of the, the, the board meetings, the board, you know, the district board members, um, even though they have their separate board as well, I think it's important to advocate for those students too. Great. Thanks. All right. Thank you commissioners for these comments on the aspirations. And I think we have some good um, direction to work with here. So, um, I'm gonna call for public comment, uh, but then try to quickly move us to, to a vote to have this subcommittee we formed for the mission statement also work on the aspirations. Uh, and then I wanna make sure that we have some time before 7.15 expires to get to the second to last agenda item. So with that, um, do we have, I did see Sasha uh, wanted to maybe make some, a pub, some public comment on, so let's move to public comment on the aspirations. And uh, Sasha, go ahead. Great, thanks Monroe. Um, so um, to Susan's point on, and also to Kate's point um, on uh, a fourth item, I think there's an opportunity to talk about transition from youth as potentially separate from transition um, in, in a facility um, when we're considering what is youth um, for anyone who has experienced the system. Um, and then also um, on point two, thinking about um, disability services. Um, I know a few commissioners were at um, a presentation before this. Um, that talked about the link between um, disability and services um, and incarceration with youth. Um, so potentially we could call that out specifically as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on the aspirations? Okay, uh, yeah, I see Wesley, your hands up. And uh, if you maybe I didn't ask Sasha to do this because so many commissioners know her, uh, but I probably should have. But Wesley, why don't you introduce yourself quickly too? Hello, I'm a high school. I'm a high schooler out of Pacifica. I currently volunteer with the San Mateo Youth Court Program, and I also help out with Marin's Youth Court. And I'm well, interested to uh, find out more about the JJDPC. Great. So, so my comment is that for aspiration number two, I noticed that the phrase was elementary and middle school children. And I think it was Susan who brought up earlier that children might not always be the most accurate description of them. So my proposal, so to speak, is that when we have an academic title in front of children, for instance, it should be relative to that. So I would propose elementary and middle school students because you're saying that they're in school. So shouldn't it be students? That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, any other public comment on these aspirations? Okay, great. Uh, so, so I mentioned that we should have the same subcommittee that's gonna work on the mission, work on these aspirations as well. And to that, I'll, I'll add, uh, come up with some suggested projects or you know, edits to the current projects. Um, so, so really, looks like we're gonna go form a subcommittee on a plan like we have done in previous years. 
um, but again, I'm glad we had this discussion as a whole commission first. So, um, so if there's no objection to adding to the responsibilities of that subcommittee, uh, then, and hearing none, we'll make that subcommittee responsible for mission and aspirations and make some suggestions for projects as well, and come back to the February meeting and take into account all of those good uh, comments and suggestions from commissioners and the public. So we only have five minutes left and I apologize, uh, Paul and Johanna for, for uh, time getting away from us, but I think we might have enough time to get to quickly to uh, agenda item uh, number six, uh, a resolution regarding trying youth as adults in San Mateo County. Yeah. Um, so please go ahead. So thank you. I hope you've all had an opportunity to review uh, this resolution uh, entitled San Mateo County Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission, resolution number 2022-02, a resolution on youth tried as adults that was included in our packet. The resolution reads, whereas the mission of the San Mateo County County Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention is to serve the public uh, conscience in the best interests of juvenile advocates for program services that prevent youth incarceration and uphold respect for the human dignity of all minors who enter the San Mateo County uh, Juvenile Justice System. Whereas the San Mateo County Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission is dedicated to evidence-based juvenile and criminal justice reform measures that improve public safety and reduce recidivism. Whereas decades of research and the US Supreme Court have confirmed that, that youth are neurologically, socially, and developmentally different from adults, and therefore are more likely to be rehabilitated by develop, developmentally appropriate treatment and intervention. Whereas the juvenile justice system was developed to address the specific behavioral, developmental, and mental health needs of youth and are therefore better equipped to hold and treat them after an offense has been committed. Therefore, it be resolved that the San Mateo County Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission supports efforts that grant juvenile courts original and exclu exclusive jurisdiction over cases involving, uh, involving youth under the age of 18. Be it further resolved that the San Mateo County Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Commission supports efforts to keep youth under the age of 18 in juvenile justice facilities instead of adult facilities. Many of you are aware that I had my uh, youthful years forfeited by the juvenile criminal justice system and I was sent off to the adult criminal justice system where I was condemned from the 11th grade up to Pelican Bay Shoe. I can only I can only paint a quick picture of some of the traumas that I experienced once I was placed in that school to prison pipeline. It was extremely traumatic and uh, lacked treatment. And again, I would like to state that, it, you know, I have very little time to explain many of the traumas that I encountered in this pipeline. And so I wanted to ask that this commission take a formal position on seeing how or viewing youth as youth and having faith that youth can be treated uh, in our youthful programs here in San Mateo County that we do not have to send them to Pelican Bay State Prison. By introducing this resolution, we seek to incorporate the commission's core principles, our aspirations, missions, into a living document that outlines our position on this to help clarify and guide our work moving forward. With that being said, I would like to make a motion to adopt resolution 2022-02 regarding trying youth as adults so we, can open, so we can open up discussion or answer any question before we take a vote. Second. Thank you. Um, oh, thank you, Commissioner Rasmussen. Um, it gives us a chance to see each other and uh, and and have and discuss this. So I see Commissioner Talria, your hand is up. Um, uh, please go ahead. Hi, Paul. I have. Um, I feel terrible about what you went through. 
Um, and I think that resolutions that actually have action items behind them are a good idea. My concern with this one, not that I disagree with anything that the resolution says, is that it doesn't appear to be one that really directly affects the youth of San Mateo County. A couple of years ago, the laws were changed. And right now, before a youth case is, is sent to adult court, it has to go before a judge who has to hold a hearing on it. In the last five years, we have sent zero youth to adult court. If we are gonna take time to put together resolutions, I would like us to see us put together resolutions that focus on issues that directly affect the youth today in San Mateo County. I would also like them to attach, attach, uh, attach action items to them so that there is some, something more than just a record of what we are agreeing to, but that there is a commitment to do something about it. For example, I think a good uh, resolution could be made about the, um, there was a change in the law a couple of years ago about how youth are transported to court, right? And it was they're supposed to be transported in at least um, least constrained way possible. Well, there's a little box you can tick that probation and transportation can click to, to say that if the youth is a security risk, they can put them in shackles, hand and feet shackles. And I've seen very young, very small children with their hands and feet shackled, their families crying when they see them show up in Redwood City courthouses. I've seen kids go to medical appointments and not be able to speak to Dr. Lonan and to be handcuffed. These are things that, these are issues that are affecting youth today. So while I will not oppose your motion, I, I just, I, it seems like going forward, it would be a good use of our time and our efforts to try and focus on things that affect the youth in our community and that have an action item attached to them. What are we going to do about it? That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tellaria. Does any, do any other, I, I'm conscious of the fact that it's just past 7.15 when our meeting is supposed to end. That said, I'm hoping that we can, for a few more minutes, maintain a quorum of commissioners and get to a vote on adopting this resolution. Uh, so to that end, are there any other questions or comments from commissioners about the resolution? Uh, I really appreciate this having been drafted and put together, and I'm excited about having resolutions to the stakes in the sand. Thank you. Right. Any other commissioners? All right, let me quickly call for public comment on this, uh, as any agenda item and motion should. Um, and uh, I'm interested to know if there are any members of the public that would like to make a comment about this resolution. Is there an opportunity to be educated a little bit by the judge or by Sharon? We could invite them to do that. And maybe some that other would, time. <laughs> but, that, but that would be their choice right now yeah. <laughs> uh, as to whether they want to do that. Um, and, and we could also have an opportunity to do it another time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hearing no public comment and, uh, and no other, um, no other uh, comments or questions from commissioners, let's move this to a vote. Uh, and just to repeat, the motion on the table is to adopt the resolution as drafted, uh, uh, com committing the commission to a, you know, a position on uh, youth being tried as adults in our county. So uh, with that, uh, I would call for a voice vote of our commissioners. Uh, Please come off mute and all commissioners in favor of adopting the motion um, for this resolution, please say aye. 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 Are any commissioners opposed? Any commissioners abstaining? All right, the motion passes. Um, we've adopted this resolution. And uh, thank you, Paul and Johanna, for bringing this forward. Um, this is. Uh, um, uh, very well drafted and, uh, and spoken for, and I'm glad the commission is taking a stand on this. Uh, and with that, we did have another agenda item about project updates, commissioner updates, and so forth. There is some information in the agenda packet, uh, 
and, and, uh, and so you can refer to that and it'll be in the minutes. Um, Commissioner Wilson, you have your hand up. I Talk just, about... go ahead. I think it's very important before we leave that we have an interview committee for new potential commissioners. So I'm reminded. Uh, sorry, we're out of time to, uh, to, to consider that, but uh, I think that as chair, I can help appoint a committee. We, it's not something we necessarily need to vote on. So I hear you and uh, we will move applications forward. And I will work with Commissioner Enriquez on that. And so thank you, everybody, for staying the extra five minutes. It was important to get that resolution passed. And uh, this meeting is adjourned. Have a great thank night, everybody. You. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Stay safe. Bye -bye. Have a great night. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.